Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Jenna Koznitsky and today we're going to talk about shunts. Now, shunts have saved countless lives over the years, but they also present many challenges for our community. Today I'm going to talk a bit about the function of shunts and how that has changed over the years. I'll also talk about shunt blockage or the occlusion of shunts. And then finally, I'll talk a bit about shunt infection and some of the research going on in that area. So first, when we talk about shunt function, it has changed over the years, although many people um, would probably say that it hasn't changed enough. So we know that for the most part, shunts work when the ICP or intracranial pressure increases to, to a certain level and opens the shunt to allow the fluid to flow. With the development of programmable valves, that has allowed doctors to match the patient characteristics or what the patient needs with when the shunt is actually opening and allows changes to be made if the patient needs change. We also have add-on devices such as gravitational devices and anti-siphon devices. And again, these were made to be add-ons that improve the function of the shunt. So with something such as an anti-siphon device or a gravitational device, we hope that in the years out, we see that they are addressing the needs of issues that arise when people have a shunt for a long time, such as over drainage and slit ventricles and even slit ventricle syndrome. So hopefully we'll start to see the rates of those issues decreasing in our community. Now, if we talk about um, shunt occlusion or the blockage of shunts, let's first talk about why they are occluding. There's research going on in this area that's looking at the body's response to the shunt when it's implanted. And so one idea is that when a shunt is implanted, it is viewed as a, a foreign body um, or a foreign device for, um, by your body. And so your body reacts to it and is trying to hide it or cover it. And in doing so, it's allowing cells to attach to that shunt, potentially blocking those shunt holes and then causing an issue in terms of fluid flow. And this seems to be quite variable depending on who you are and may help to explain some of the differences in shunt revision rates or blockage rates that we see in different patients. If you talk to your neurosurgeon, you might also hear them say that when a shunt is blocked and they take that shunt out, they often see cord plexus attached to the shunt. Now for a long time, doctors assumed that the shunt was actually sucking up the cord plexus. Now we think that that also may be happening, but that initial um, covering of the shunt by cells that your body is producing called immune cells are actually maybe acting as a scaffold or as a landing pad for the cord plexus to make it easier for the cord plexus to attach to the shunt and then block the holes of the shunt. So as we learn more about why the shunt is actually being blocked, we can develop better ways of trying to address the problem and prevent the issue altogether. So there is a lot of active research in this area and there has been over the years. We have seen changes in shunt designs um, that have been tested where you add many more holes or have fewer holes. You have larger holes or smaller holes or you put them in a different um, design or distribution on the shunt. You, we've also seen research looking at different biomaterials to um, make the shunt out of or to add on top of the shunt to try to address some of these issues. As we learn more about why the shunts are actually being blocked, we'll be able to develop more targeted treatments or changes to the shunt to address those issues and hopefully have better outcomes of that line of research. So now, um, in addition to you know, why the shunt is actually being blocked, there is research on the clinical side where neurosurgeons have been trying over the years to find the best way and place to place a shunt. That research so far hasn't given us any you know, golden standards to uh, put our hat on, so it's still very much an open area of research, but it's something that our doctors are looking at and actively trying to address. We, now I'll move on to shunt infection. So shunt infections 
affect a minority of our population. However, when a shunt infection occurs, it is a major issue that results in very long hospital stays and greatly increases your risk of having another shunt infection, which would require another shunt revision. And so you can see, and I'm sure you've heard of um, stories of people that have gone in for a shunt infection and it resulted in multiple, multiple revisions and long hospital stays. Now there was a, a large randomized control trial um, out of Europe called the BASICS trial that looked at antibiotic impregnated catheters to see if that reduced the number of shunt infections. And what that group found in this really well-designed trial was that it did in fact decrease shunt infections. So that is great. Um, and hopefully the doctors are taking that data and running with it. We also have our clinical networks looking at you know, other ways that they can reduce shunt infections. So the HCRN or the Hydrocephalus Clinical Research Network years ago had published a data, a data set showing that certain protocols can actually greatly reduce shunt infection rates at their hospitals. Since then, the group has been trying different iterations or different combinations of protocols based on available data, such as that basics data, and also looking within their network at individual hospitals and saying, this network had a very low shunt infection rate. What are they doing that's different from other groups and may explain why that infection rate is so low? Then they incorporate that in that pro new protocol aspect in, uh, in a very structured way to the current protocol and test to see what the results are. So again, there's actually been quite a bit of progress in terms of reducing shunt infections. We hope to see that continue so that shunt infections are a really a rare event in hydrocephalus um, and would greatly decrease the amount of stress that patients feel and families feel but and improve outcomes for our community as a whole. So again, I know that maybe shunts haven't um, progressed as much or as quickly as people would have liked. There are new um, shunts, either new on the market or coming onto the market soon, that are looking at additional ways of addressing some of these issues. So that in involves new coatings of the shunt catheter, that can also in involve actual flushing of the catheter to try to prevent shunt occlusion or blockage from happening altogether. Um, so stay tuned and hopefully in the next few years we'll have some really great updates where we can say, you know, this process or this protocol greatly reduced it, reduced the number of shunt revisions that are needed in our population and improves the outcomes of our, of our community as a whole. So I hope you enjoyed this research update. Um, please let me know if you have any questions and I'll be back next month with a new update. Thanks so much, have a good one.